Hello, and welcome to our premiere episode of Whispers of Time, an Everyday Heroes RPG campaign crossover inspired by Highlander, The Crow, and Assassin's Creed. A couple of things before we get started. First off, Whispers of Time will be dealing with some adult themes that include graphic depictions of violence, and in this particular episode, we deal with the loss of an unborn child. So, please proceed with caution. Second, through our friends at Evil Genius Games, we have entered into a partnership with Sirenscape, an online source for RPG music and sound effects. We are so excited for this opportunity, and we appreciate all of the support and assistance that we've received from both companies to make this possible. So be sure to check out Everyday Heroes and Sirenscape, and tell them Dream Slayer Studios sent you. Last but not least... If you like what you see here, then we would really appreciate it if you would maybe show your support on Patreon. Every little bit helps, and with your support, we can continue to make our live plays even better as time marches on. And now, without further ado, let's begin tonight's episode of Whispers of Time. What? 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 Huh? No. I do not consent. <laughs> All right, so uh, I'm just going to jump right into this. And Dragon, I think I've got your name maybe backwards. It's Hasu Hayashi, right? Yes. Okay. All right. I wrote it backwards originally just because like, that's how they usually do it. And then I was like, wait, that's probably going to be confusing to people. Gotcha. Okay. That's Hasu? informative. Sorry. Oh, it's all right. Hasu Hayashi, a Japanese-American computer and architectural design prodigy and prolific author, found herself working for an up-and-coming game development company known as Renaissance. Renaissance had made a name for themselves with their uncanny accuracy and attention to detail in their recreations of historical events, locations, and time periods. Recently, Renaissance had been tapped to create a Lovecraftian horror title called The Streets Run Red, which called for a full immersive experience centered around the legend of Jack the Ripper in Victorian London. Hasu learned as much as possible about the time period and made countless trips overseas, visiting libraries and architectural firms in London as she worked with her designers both in person and remotely to create the most realistic version of Victorian London ever created in digital format. She spent years on the project and became very familiar with the history and came to know every street and back alley from Victorian London like the back of her hand. When she stayed in London on her many trips overseas, she often stayed at the same bed and breakfast, a place called the Top Hat Inn. During one of her play tests of the streets of the streets run red, she found herself in an altercation with an NPC in the game. She fired a pistol and missed, hitting the corner of the very same building that would become the Top Hat Inn in the real world. On her next trip to London, she was startled to spot what appeared to be an old bullet hole in the exact spot where her errant shot had struck the wall in the game. Asu wrote this off as a coincidence, but the next time she was in game, on a lark, she carved her initials in a, discreet, in a discreet location in the back alley of the top hat. Much to her surprise, in the real world, her initials, worn and weathered through time, appeared on the back wall. Thinking she was going mad, she shared her feelings with a select few fellow employees of Renaissance, as well as her husband. Her co-workers laughed it off as too much time researching old Saucy Jack 
and play testing mixed with a lack of sleep. Her husband was doubtful, but concerned that she was suffering anxiety and fatigue. They were, after all, expecting their first child. Hasu, in a desperate move to prove that she wasn't going crazy and to prove the game development company that had hired Renaissance, Abstergo Entertainment, had more nefarious plans for the release of The Streets Run Red. She decided to take matters into her own hands. And these particular measures were drastic, to say the least. An animal lover, Hayashi never dreamed she would be capable of what she would do next in her next and final playtest. In game, she searched high and low for an animal on the verge of death begging to be put out of its misery. After hours of searching, she found a poor black cat who had been crushed under the wheels of a passing wagon. Still clinging to life, the cobblestones running red with blood. She held the cat, gently stroking it, offering some final moments of comfort. And with a quick mo motion of her hands, she silenced the poor creature, ending its suffering. She found a secluded area in game to bury the cat's body, wrapping it in a blue scarf and placing it in a metal container before laying it to rest. Back in the real world, she returned to the spot where she had buried the cat in game. Under cover of darkness, she set about digging in the area, and much to her disdain, she uncovered the skeletal remains of the cat, still draped in the blue scarf. With this discovery, she came to realize that somehow she was connecting with a living, breathing individual from the past, and somehow controlling their movements. The implications of this were overwhelming, to say the least. And if this technology was released to the masses, the course of history could be rewritten. Hysterical, she called her husband, who rushed to her side from across the pond. By the time he had arrived, she was in such a state of panic, he was unable to get through to her and had to call the authorities, sadly forcing her to go under psychiatric evaluation and spending over a week in a rehabilitation unit. Interestingly enough, during her hospital stay, Abstergo Entertainment pulled the agreement from Renaissance, and the company rushed to force legal action on the surprise termination of their contract. So it is at this point we will join Hasu and her husband as they return home from overseas. The two of you are exhausted from your trip. And as the taxi pulls up to your brownstone home, you can't wait to climb the steps, start a warm fire in the fireplace and kick your feet up for a nice long nap. As you open the door, your heart nearly jumps out of your chest as the lights suddenly come on and the verbal assault of surprise hits you like a shotgun. I scream, ah! In the center of the living room are your mom and dad, surrounded by the rest of your family and a smattering of co-workers and friends. Your mom, God love her, always had a terrible sense of timing and although you love her dearly, Sometimes she was a little inconsiderate of your feelings. Add to that, your husband very likely didn't communicate that you had spent the last week or so in the loony bin, uh, excuse me, rehabilitation center. Uh, so there you are. And surrounded by all of these folks, you're exhausted and mentally just out of it at this point. But there's I, I got a pretty big uh uh pregnant belly too yeah yeah 
So I'm super, like, exhausted and stressed, and I probably peed a little bit. <laughs> probably so. Uh, Mom comes over to you and just gives you a big bear hug. She's probably about six inches shorter than you are. <laughs> uh, but her arms are strong and she nearly lifts you up off of the off of the ground. She's so happy to see you. Oh, uh, baby, it's so good to see you. I'm so, oh, I'm so sorry that we missed everything. And I know you probably weren't expecting this. We were supposed to do it last week, but you were gone. And I just couldn't wait any longer. I know that the gender reveal party was supposed to happen, but we just couldn't wait. So here we are and we're just happy to have you home. Uh, I kind of like look around to see uh, how many people are here, you would say? There's probably about 25 people here. Oh, okay, wow. All right. Um, I just kind of smile at her and give her a hug. And then like in Japanese to her, I'm just going to be like, oh, I can't believe now of all times you have the worst timing. Um, and then in English, I'll be like, thanks, Ma, love you. Um, hi, everybody. Um, you know, kind of have my mom on one side and I'm kind of clinging to my husband and the other. And I will kind of pull him uh, close to me and be like, you got to help me get through these people. I just want to sit down. And they all one by one kind of come up to you, give you congratulations and start throwing presents at you and, you know, just having a grand old time. They've got music playing in the background, some sort of jazzy little tune uh, that's kind of running in the background. Everybody's kind of talking. They've already got drinks. Uh, your mom said everybody up. Uh, so they certainly aren't going anywhere real fast. Um, once the hugs and uh, warm introductions are all done, uh, your mom uh, just as your husband is sitting you down, comes over and takes you by the arm and leads you into the kitchen. <laughs> All right, that's okay. I could probably eat. And uh -huh. your mom's a baker. She's, you know, really very well known for her cakes and pies and pastries and whatnot. And she said, come on, I need some help in here. I've got something that needs to be uh, warmed up before we get started. So uh i listen i heard what you said and i know i my timing has never been the best and i realize that but you have to understand that your father and i are just so excited and we were just looking so forward to finding out what our grandbaby is going to be that we just needed you know something to just get the ball rolling and, and i know i'm sorry you've i'm sure you're really tired but ah <sighs> we're just we're selfish i mean there's no other way to say it your father and i are just selfish and and we're sorry but we're, okay. we're just, we just can't okay. wait it's okay mom i give her a hug I'm, that's just the jet lag talking I, I appreciate you did all of this and you got everybody together here for me and it's it's i really was surprised i'm just i'm just tired and i'm i'm definitely hungry what, what okay. a great yeah. Well, we have plenty of stuff out there, uh, hors d'oeuvres and so forth that you just help yourself to, but you've got to show me how to turn this stupid thing on. I'm not used to these new types of stoves. <laughs> I kind of just a slight curse in Japanese underneath my breath and walk her over to the, I assume it's some kind of fancy smart stove and all that. Yeah. Uh, and then, yeah, I'll, I'll kind of show off and like, uh, pull out my my uh, smartphone and show her how I can adjust the settings through the, through the app. Cool. So you go in, you start the settings and then uh, click click the button to go on and you hear t -t 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 <laughs> and the stove explodes in a ball of fire. I'm so much so uh, dexterity save. Yeah, probably not going to be able to do that <laughs> because the entire brownstone blows up. Oh. Everybody in the party incinerated by a bomb that went off inside that stove. Damn. Soldier. 
Yes. You find yourself in the kitchen during those final moments of Has ha Hasu Hayashi's life. You're watching it happen. You're watching Hasu go to the phone, click the button to turn it on, and the stove engulfs the room in fire. And you have that this instinct of trying to stop it, and you're moving towards it, and as you do, the explosion goes into slow motion as it slowly begins to burn everything moving out in its circumference. Within the glowing flames, they're coming towards you come a series of visions. You see visions of men dressed in white running across clay rooftops as church bells clang in the distance. A clash of swords as a splatter of blood sprays across the blooms of a cherry blossom tree. Visions of men in red coats charging across a battlefield through rain and mud. A pair of Wild West gunslingers in a small western town in a deadly shootout. A 1930s Ford Model V8 screeching to a halt outside a bank, Tommy guns popping out of the window and peppering the passers-by with a hailstorm of bullets. Now, fully engulfed by the explosion, time freezes, and you let out a death-curdling scream. The explosion pulls itself into your mouth as you gasp for air, and you are in the white space, the void, the place where nothing exists. And then you, like the oven moments before, explode. But it's not fire that spews forth from your body. A cacophony of moths erupt from your form, scattering in all directions. And through the swarm, more images appear in your mind. You see a tall, handsome black man of about 35 outside the Metropolitan Museum in New York City. He carries a large satchel and he wears a long overcoat. As he passes by, you can see the cold flash of steel just for a moment under the flap of his jacket. The scene shifts and you see a beautiful African-American woman in her late twenties wearing rose sunglasses and a multicolored silk skirt. She's visiting veterans in a homeless shelter tending to their illnesses and cuts and bruises from their life on the street. The scene shifts again. You see a scruffy Caucasian man walking through what seems to be Chelsea, wearing a white hoodie and toting a heavy backpack over his shoulder. He's a simple looking man, if not a bit paranoid. He keeps his head low, attempting to blend in with the crowd. It seems as if someone might be following him, but no tail can be seen. He pulls out a set of keys and opens the door to a storefront that looks like an antique store. And finally, you witness a morgue. Deathly quiet. Several bodies are laid out on slabs. A single light is on in the center of the room, casting a small circle of light on the floor. In the light, oddly, there stands a single black cat. And then you awaken in your friend Vic's basement. Home for now. And uncontrollably, you utter a single foreboding phrase. This is the beginning. So this is the most intense vision that you have ever experienced to date. And there's a distinct
feeling that you have regarding the visions that you saw. Number one, the death of the Japanese woman felt all too real. And you feel like it has already happened. It's not something that you were witnessing in real time, but something that happened recently. Second, the images of the past were not really like visions. They were more like memories. Hey. Third, and this one is probably the hardest to explain. Although you have never met the man with the satchel and the hidden blade outside the Met, you feel like you know him. He looks so familiar. And he looks like someone you can trust. And as if on cue out of the corner of your eye, you see your uh, Owlet Moth companion fluttering at the window near the ceiling of your basement apartment. You've seen him react like this before after a vision. And he's calling to you. Phew, yeah, I take a couple minutes and kind of wipe the sweat from my brow and I'm start looking around for my, my sock hat, put it on, and I'm just, I sit and I think, and I start thumbing through my tarot cards. Um, not to, not necessarily to accomplish any one thing, it's more like a comfort thing. It just does a, does a quick flip for herself and looks at them and distracts herself from everything she just saw. She's kind of overwhelmed by it. Um, and then when she realizes, you know, the moth is acting up, uh, she's she's going to go and reach out to it like this and let it kind of alight on her finger. Mm -hmm. And she's just kind of looking at him for a minute, letting him kind of dance around on her hand. And then she just says, what do you want from me? And he flies away and flies up the stairs. Okay. She takes a deep breath and totally, totally unsure of herself. Um, she looks around the room and grabs uh, her two knives that she's got and she puts um, one in a back pocket, one in a boot. Um, she grabs her deck of a stack of uh, tarot cards, puts them in a little satchel she keeps around her arm with her or on her purse with her ID in it and stuff and she just says okay and then starts going up the stairs to see if she can see where the moth is going what part of New York uh, do you live I had always imagined this was Hell's Kitchen okay all right uh, um, go ahead I was gonna say with with that said like so he doesn't freak out like if i'm about to leave with this moth or when i get upstairs i kind of tap on the door to see if vic's in and i'm gonna let him i'll let him know i'm taking off for a while mm -hmm. all right tap on his door he pops it open what's up kiddo hey vic uh hey listen i this i'm okay i just had the wildest craziest dream uh i think i'll be fine i i just need to go for a walk for a little bit i just want to let you know i'm not I want, i'm not downstairs i'll I'll be home later. You're a big girl. Yeah, I know. You also worry too much. I so. know, but I'm not your daddy. But you, you can come and go as you please. You know that. Yeah, yeah, I know. I just, I don't know. Something doesn't, something doesn't feel right. I just, I think I'll be okay. I just need some fresh air. Well, if there's one thing I've learned about you in these last couple of months is learn to trust your instincts. So, you know, do what you got to do. Yeah, we'll do, Vic. Okay, take care, okay? I'll be home later. Hey, and I turn kid. Around and, yeah. Hey, kid. Yeah? Even though you don't have to, thanks for checking in with me. Always, Vic. You, I appreciate everything you've done for me and got to keep you up to date on my wares about some whatnot. So, listen, just have a good day. Stay out of trouble at work. All right, be careful out there. Hey, it looks like it's going to rain. 
and she with that she'll go back downstairs real quick and if there's an umbrella in that room which i hope there is she'll go ahead and she'll go ahead and grab it just in case and then goes back up and starts kind of peeking around for the moth yep oh yeah he's he's hanging out by the front door waiting for you as soon as i see him i i just mutter to myself i'm like oh here we go again lead the way i suppose <laughs> You open the door and the moth flutters out. Uh, and Vic was right; uh, it is overcast out there today. It hasn't started raining just yet, uh, but you can see it's coming. Uh, the sky is kind of a misty gray. There's a little bit of a low-hanging fog as you come out, um, and you're in for a little bit of a haul with this moth. Uh, he goes flying. And you've probably done something like this before with him. And he kind of weaves in and out. He'll stop. He'll rest for just a moment. And then he'll move on again. Okay. You end up uh, in the part of town where that first vision of the man that you felt like you might know you're very close to the Met right now. Uh, okay. And as you're rounding the corner, you see it appear uh, just around the corner. Okay. Um, so I immediately, I mean, I start scanning the crowd a little bit, um, kind of looking for the guy, and I'm, I'm thinking to myself, like, what am I doing? Am I am I crazy? Like I don't I don't know this person. I'm not sure. What do I even say? And all all the while I'm thinking about that stuff. I'm kind of look trying to keep my eyes peeled to see see if I can spot the guy. Um, if he's not outside, I'll kind of head in and start peeking around the lobby. Okay. Um, Sean, what would have brought your character to the Metropolitan Museum today? He's always been a fan of art. And uh, no matter what generation, he's just been a fan. And so he's he's there to visit art. And also it's to get his mind off of things. That's where he goes to sort of wander the, uh, the exhibits. What time do you think you would have gotten here today? Um, Probably just around one o'clock or two o'clock. Mm -hmm. Spent what, maybe about two, three hours in there? Yeah. 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 So maybe about close to maybe closing time. It's probably in the middle of the week, so they probably don't stay open past five. Um, a little bit before closing time, you're heading out uh, and walking down the grand staircase that leads up to the Met. Um, and I will have both you and Soldier roll a perception check. Soldier, you're kind of scanning that crowd outside, uh, and then coming down the steps, you see the man that was in your vision. He's taking the exact same path that he took in the vision. Where you are standing right now is the exact same viewpoint that you had in that vision. Um, Sean, for your character, I won't say your name yet, um, you notice off down at the base of the steps uh, a girl wearing a green sock hat and a scarf that as soon as you walk out, you see the look on her face <laughs> and it's a little bit of a look of surprise. Uh, but she's... Are you staring him down? Yes, but it's that dead eye stare where like, I'm like a deer in headlights type of thing. Where it's like... Huh, uh, I'm not like boring my eyes through him, but like if I'm not looking at him, I'm looking through him. You know, it's, it's kind of like that dead eyed stare where I'm like, oh, what do I do? <laughs> So you spot that, Sean, and with the role that you got, um, there's also a little something kind of curious there as well, uh, because 
lit on her shoulder. Uh, you just could m mistake it for like a pin on the scarf, but it, it moves and crawls ever so slightly. There's a moth, an owlet moth specifically, uh, that is on her shoulder. And for some reason that rings a bell to you. He has a sly grin that comes across his face. And he thinks to himself, the moth doth return. And he slowly makes his way over to her. Hello, I am Oswin. Os Oswin, uh, hi. Uh, I'm, this is gonna sound weird. I don't know why I'm here, but I think I'm supposed to find you. And your name is? And she thinks for a brief moment and almost says her real name, but then catches herself and says, Soldier. Well met. So what brings you out on this overcast day? She kind of glances on her shoulder at where the moth is and uh and just says I guess you could say Saturn I know that probably sounds weird um I, I don't talk to anyone on purpose like this that I don't know but I cannot shake this feeling like I'm supposed to to find you and talk to you. I wish I could tell you what brought me here other than him. Um, but I don't know. I just know something. Don't ask me how I know, but I know something bad will happen if I didn't find you. And now I found you. I, I'm soldiering. I, I don't know what else to do. It's not at all strange. He holds out his finger as if to beckon the moth to it. And Saturn flutters over to your finger. He raises it up. He looks at it. What do you have to say today of all days? And the and moth takes off again, going in a different direction this time. And she looks after the moth and then looks at him and, and just is like, I thought I was... How, how did you? I think we should follow. He turns and starts walking after the moth. And Soldier just sticks back for a minute. She's completely stunned. She's never seen any, anybody even notice that moth before, let alone reach out and talk to it. And then after they get a little good distance away, she's just like, uh, I'm coming. And then starts running, kind of running after him. Uh, Clint. Yes. You have returned from a little outing uh, to your little antique shop. Mm -hmm. um, where were you? And what are you doing now that you're back here? Mm -hmm. I was let's see i was actually probably uh what time of day is it uh it's about getting close to five o'clock in the evening five o'clock in the evening mm -hmm. um i went to go get takeout for my meal later at the uh, deli on the corner and um i am if it's around five o'clock i am just getting ready to um turn out the lights of the shop and put up the clothes sign and go do upstairs. You, do you have somebody that minds the shop when you're not there? Uh, no, I just close the shop. Okay. It's usually, I get very few walk-ins. It's normally by appointment only. Gotcha. All right. It's so not, you, a, not on a busy street. Yeah. So you're probably just maybe tidying up, counting down mm -hmm. the drawer, you know, if, if you had any intakes at all today. Um, or sales. 
Uh, and just as you're getting ready to get up and walk up to the door to lock it, um, <laughs> you get about halfway there and then you see a shadow that kind of appears on the doorstep. Um, and a tall black man opens the door, followed by a younger Caucasian woman. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. May I help you? I was just closing. My soldier kind of looks up at uh, at Oswin and then uh, back at this shop person and then says, uh, I don't know exactly how you can help us, but I know you have to. Pardon me? S sorry. Um, I, oh, that had to have sounded weird. I, I, um, this is Oswin, and we, uh, are here now. Um, you, what's your name? Um, well, the name of the store's Carl's Antiques, so my name's Carl. You're Carl. Oh, okay, wow. Um, hi. Um... I'm soldier. What, what, what can I help you out with? I'm getting. It's, I've had a long day. I'm getting ready to close up shop. If you're not looking for anything in specific, you can come back some other time to browse. Uh, we were looking for some some one specific. Um, Pardon me. We, we, we were looking for you, actually. Oh, uh, you. Um. Why don't you just you just leave? Get out of my shop right now. Os Both Oswin of you, has you need a. To get uh, out. Also, Oswin has a. A flash of recognition across his face. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm asking you to leave, and you're not leaving. You need to get out of my shop right now. We and will. I start backing up towards the counter because I keep a baseball bat under the counter. And Clint, when you hear this tall man say your name, the voice, and in conjunction with the visual, uh, there's something about this guy that rings a bell to you. Not the girl so much, but this guy. And you would know you've you know you've seen him before. Would I relate it to my previous employer? Would you relate it to yep. them? Probably not. Okay. I just kind of look at Oswin funny. Look, I don't want any problems. I don't know why you're here. I don't keep any money in the shop. Everything I do is by credit card transaction or, you know, money orders, transfer of, you know, money electronically. I need you to leave right now, just please. We're not looking for money. In fact, I think we're looking for you. You need to leave. Uh, Chris, before we, before we go too much further here, mm -hmm before he fully gets mad and kicks us out. <laughs> Can I use my sight beyond sight to ask you something about him and then kind of parlay that? Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to spend a genius point. Okay. And I want, I want to know, I want to know kind of on the line of the, what do they respect question? But I, I want to know what, who do they trust? Who does he trust? Who who does he? Is there anyone in his life that is a trust a trustful that I couldn't possibly know? Okay, that does not take an action. Okay. And at the level that you are currently at in this time period, you could probably ask at least four questions. Oh no, kidding! Oh awesome! Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. fantastic. Then yeah, we're gonna go. We're gonna start there. Um, and your first one was, who does he trust? Yeah, is there anyone he trusts? Okay. Um, Clint, Damn. you're going to probably have to answer that question. Uh, and you have to answer it honestly. Given my... No, there's actually no one I fully trust. Okay. And that actually, I mean, that answer that answers it for Soldier. And if she, if she catches on to that and, you know, her and her psychic connection if she catches on to that that registers next question um what's his 
what's a big weakness of his? I'll let <laughs> Quint answer that as well. You have to answer it honestly. Um, a big weakness? He's an overachiever. Um, no. Um, Workaholic. <laughs> a, uh, probably um, a greed for probably antiquities from the Renaissance era. Got it. That okay. is that is a focus of mine right now. Okay. Uh, and then what's something you cherish? Something you hold dear? My anonymity. Okay. And then the, the last one, I'm a, I'm gonna ask both you and Chris because of how it's phrased. I want to see if I can alter the phrasing a bit. The what kind of being are they? Obviously human, but is there a? I'm trying to think of how to phrase that question where it's like, can I get insight into like his not his past lives or anything, but like mm. his his general like now he's Carl's antique store. What was he doing 10 years ago type of thing? Or, what, or who was he 10 years ago? Let's put it like that. Is that a question that can be answered? That's two questions. Oh, who, who was he 10 years ago? Well, what what type of being is, is one question and who was yes. he 10 years ago would be another it, yeah, the kind of being one is kind of that's what made me think of it is because like that I don't want to say it that way like mm -hmm. as a as a human or a spirit so I'm trying to narrow it down of like to like essentially what function he served ten years sure. ago essentially like that. Would it be safe to say, Clint, mm -hmm. that Carl was essentially a prisoner? Yes. Okay, perfect. That's that's the four. That's what I need. So as he as he is starting to kick us out, I just say, "Stop. Listen. I you you no, just please. need to get you out." You were in prison once. You were in prison once. You cherish your anonymity. I know this. You don't trust anyone. Get the you have no fuck way. out right now. You trust us, but I'm begging get you. Get the fuck out. out. Oswin says, "Huh." One moment. Opens up his coat. Pulls what? out the rapier, the? pulls out the rapier, and says, "I got this from an old, old friend." He holds it up like this, it says, "I thought you might be interested." And you recognize that sword. And seeing that sword, with the man, and with the voice, it's not associated with your former employer per se this associated with something that you saw in the animus like I said I'm a very old friend would you be able to appraise it and he kind of just hands it over as, as if he's you know beckoning him to grab it from him It's priceless. I do. What would you say about it? If you had to put a price, what's it worth to you? Who are you? My name is Oswin Barca. You're much beyond your name. Who are you? Hmm. I'm not hiding anything. But I'm very old. And it would be surprising if I know who made this sword. And when he says that about being very old, he immediately connected that sword to him in the 1500s. Mm -hmm. But you've seen this man multiple times over the ages, and you can't quite explain it but you've seen him 
The memories that you have about him are foggy, but you've seen him in feudal Japan, the Edo okay. period. You've seen him in the Wild West. You've seen him during the American Revolution. You've seen him in Chicago during the Prohibition era. But those memories are not clear. Okay, his back. voice, that face, that sword. Aswan has a warning smile. Why are you here? Like I said, I think we're here for you. Sojourn, why are you here? Maybe you can explain it. And he kind of just gestures over to Sojourn. Honestly, I, I can't explain it much better than that. We know things that we could not possibly know, and I don't know why we know them, but I know that we're here, and I know that we're here for you, and you need to trust us. I'm if not you, it, going if you, back. You don't have to go back anywhere, I don't think. I don't know. I don't under I understand fully why we're here, but I need you. We need you to trust us. The one thing I do know is that you used to be a prisoner and that should tell you that I know things I couldn't possibly know. And one thing I know is that if you don't come with us, terrible things are going to happen. I know that's scary. I know that seems weird. I, kn I know it seems like I'm making it up, but why would I? To what end? Why would I do this? We need your help. How did you find me? She kind of looks down at her shoulder and says, you wouldn't believe me if I told you, but let's just say it was Saturn. You need to tell me how you found me. If you want me to come with you, you need to tell me. She reaches over and gets the moth on her finger and kind of holds it out and lets it walk on her hand in front of him and says, this is Saturn. He led us here. I saw you in some visions what else did you see in the visions? There was so much. Tell me. There was. Well, we saw you. Um, we saw. I saw the past uh, a long time ago, and I I saw battles, and I saw blood. Uh, I saw Tommy guns going off. I, I saw many different ages, and then in my dream the moth this guy saturn he came to me and led me to first to oswin here and then to you and i gotta my instinct is, is to always follow this this moth i i can't explain that we don't need to get into it right now but that's why i'm here we need your help Carl. You seem familiar. Have we not met before? Somewhere, sometime seems familiar. We've met. Wait, you guys know each other? I don't know if we know each other, but there's definitely familiarity. Where might we have met? And was it the first time? I don't remember where we met. Mm. I've erased all of those memories. Tried to forget. Why? Why would you want to forget? Because it wasn't what? me. Now it's always you. Just like it was always me just depends on how we deal with our past. No. It wasn't me, it wasn't my past. It was other mm. people's pasts and I was in them. And I was doing things that I shouldn't be doing. Made to do things that I shouldn't have done. Carl. What? The one thing I can tell you is we're not here to punish you. 
we're not finding you for bad reasons. We don't care what you've done in the past. We're here to ask for help. Oh. If I was worried you were going to hurt me now, you wouldn't be standing here in this store. Trust me, there are people out there that can do a lot more to me than you possibly could. And I believe you. I don't doubt that I either. Do. That's not why we're here. Carl. What? Were we ever friends? Maybe we can start with that. I don't know. Neither do I. But you seem familiar and a friend. Let's start with that. Is there somewhere we can go? Maybe a cup of coffee? That might be in order. I don't have any friends. I can't have any friends. <laughs> well then, glad to meet your acquaintance. <laughs> Shall we have that cup of coffee now? You're not going away, are you? <laughs> no, no. No, I'm not. I tend to stick around a long time. After all these years, and it was a fucking moth that found me. <laughs> Look, Austin just... chuckles. He kind of laughs as he just thinks back. Look, just come with us. If you catch any kind of whiff that we're... I don't know, fucking with you in some way, then you can just get up and go. But you gotta come with us now. Where are we going? What are we doing? You don't know why you're here. So where are we going now? What? Like I said, maybe we should talk about this. Have a cup of coffee, will you? And he takes the rapier and puts it back in his coat, back in its sheath, brings his coat, kind of shuffles around, pulls out his wallet, opens it to count the cash, kind of puts it back in his in his pocket. And says, Coffee will be on me. Lead the way. Said you had visions. I don't know. Right. You saw us when I was looking at so so John. Oh, that's right. You said you had visions. Me, Oswin. Who mm -hmm. else? Well, I, I don't know their names, obviously, but there, there was a woman, uh, pretty tall, pretty. Uh, she seemed to be taking care of people, and, and then there. Uh, uh, was another woman um, she was in a house and there was a party and then there was an explosion I I think she might already be gone I don't I don't know something tells me she's gone but the, there is one more person uh, the, the pretty lady I think she was helping older people maybe veterans in, in my vision or something I, I couldn't quite tell it's almost like she was a nurse we got to find her next, I think. Please. I take my coffee with oat milk. Oat milk it is. And Oswin kind of just turns. You have tonight. And walks out. Yep. I look yep. You have tonight. Just tonight. That's that's all. That's all we're asking. Please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oswin walks out, opens the door, and just leaves and waits for them outside. As I walk out, I'm fiddling with my, just fiddling with my scarf nervously. Put my food in the fridge that I keep underneath the counter. Make sure the little doors, cash door is locked. Set the alarm. Go up, lock the door. So okay. where are we going? Well, one thing I've learned, there's a Starbucks on every corner. I so, hate Starbucks. You know support the, the place? support the local economy. Come on, lead the way. <laughs> and Carl leads you all to the local coffee shop. It's got a sign that says "World's Best Coffee" in the front. They're lying. 
<laughs> but it's not bad. Oh, we lost it again. Hold on. She comes, she goes, she comes, yeah. she goes. <laughs> hey, Sid. Where I have you located uh, mm -hmm. is a place called St. Andrew's Shelter for Homeless Veterans. Okay. And this is inside an old Catholic chapel, kind of weathered by time and grace and stands as a haven for those that have weathered the storms of life. Um, the exterior of this building is adorned with stained glass windows depicting scenes of compassion and solace and whispers of a sanctuary reborn for a noble cause. Um, you are there basically attending to some of the veterans uh, that are there in the building. Um, and after the trio that uh, went for coffee uh, kind of do their best to get uh, Carl calm down and uh, and continue their little travels. Uh, at the coffee shop, uh, Saturn is patiently waiting outside on the window <laughs> until you guys go. Every once in a while, he gives a little bit of a flutter, like, come on, come on, let's go. <laughs> uh, and eventually, you guys make your way uh, to St. Andrews. Um, so as you guys step through the entrance, kind of a, a gentle warmth embraces you. Oswin, you get that feeling that starts in your feet and kind of works its way up to your core, that tingly feeling that you associate with holy ground. Uh, the chapel's pews have made way for wooden tables serving as a makeshift cafeteria. The air inside is alive with the aromas of coffee and simple meals, creating an atmosphere of communal spirit. The dim, hollowed space is filled with a quiet murmur of conversations and the occasional rustle of paper or clanking of tin cups. There's a modest partition draped with humble fabrics marking the boundary between the common area and the sleeping quarters. Um, so you guys find yourself there in what essentially is the lobby here of the homeless shelter. Hmm. By the way, Sojourn, if I were you, I'd trust the moth. I do. No, oh, I, I trust him. Don't worry. I just sometimes don't know what he wants. In that, we are the same. Now, we must figure out why we're here. Who's in charge? Let's go find them. And he goes to what looks like a desk or an office uh, or anybody who's actually serving and doing mm -hmm. something as opposed to uh, getting situated. Yeah, one of the many cafe desks that are in here has just been kind of set up as like a little bit of a kind of little office area for one of the workers. And you see them kind of flipping through papers. They've got a laptop out and typing some stuff there. So they look probably like the most official person in the room. Fina. Does he happen to recognize her? Or uh, in the same way that he felt about Carl? Not this person. No, she's okay. uh, kind of a shorter, nondescript uh, Caucasian woman. He walks up and asks, Excuse me. I'm yes. curious. How many people do you have here in a night? Are you always booked? We're usually packed to the gills just about every night. Uh, we can house about 50 uh, back beyond the partition over there. Well, I'd like to help. Oh, so oh, excellent. Who can I talk to about that? Well, I can get you signed up right here if you'll just fill out this form uh, as a volunteer. Are your friends here to volunteer as well? They're here with me, but no. 
I'm here on my own. Well, just fill out this form and we'll get everything processed. Picks up, is that a clipboard or something like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He picks it up, pulls the pen and uh, walks, as he turns around, he walks over and he says, so anything, Sojourn? Anything at all? As he starts to fill out the form. I'm watching him fill out the form form to see what he's writing down. (laughs) Okay. And yeah, I'm just I'm looking around. Did the did the moth come in with me on my shoulder here? Yep. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. The moth so... kind of flew over towards the partition there yep. in the back and kind of lights on the curtain and just kind of begins to crawl up towards the top. There's a separation there of probably about 20 feet or so because this is a pretty high ceiling in this old chapel. Uh, so they basically have just stretched like a two by four, uh, all the way across to kind of create the, uh, partition between the cafeteria and the, uh, uh, the rest area back there. Okay. So yeah, I'll, I'll kind of follow the moth over towards that and see, um, kind of peek or peek around and see if I can spot this person from my vision. Mm-hmm. All right. Kind of peek through the curtains and then, uh, about halfway through the back there, you see, uh, a very beautiful uh, African-American woman with long kind of curly hair and big red rosy sunglasses. Uh, She's got them kind of up on her head here while she's kind of tending to one of the men there. And again, from your viewpoint, this is the same viewpoint that you had in the vision. And yeah, with, uh, with that, like, I, uh, go to approach and I just kind of timidly, very timidly, uh, walk up and, and just say, hi, um, excuse me. Mm-hmm. Hey, um, you, you work here? Uh, volunteer here. What can I help Volunteer. You? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, my name's, uh, soldier and well, oh you? boy. I, oh, Thanks. You okay? I, yeah, yeah, no, I'm just, um, I'm kind of overwhelmed. I, I don't really know how to say this, but I came here to find you. Oh, well, all right. Hi. Hi. <laughs> I'm Professor um, Burton. You can call me Celia. Celia? Oh, uh, hi, Celia. Um, I don't know. The, the, the thing is, I found you, so that's good. Um, I don't know why I'm supposed to, though, and I... I have some people who want to meet you. Do you have a minute? Can you come? Can you? Interesting. Yeah, let me let me get this wrapped up, and then I'll come talk to you and your friends. How about that? Sure. I'll, I'll just go back and wait out in the lobby for you. That okay? Yeah. Do you need a water or anything? Good. No, I'm good. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Well, Sweet. Really. All right. <laughs> you know, let me know if you need anything. I'll be right with you. Uh, I'm okay. Thanks. I'll, I'll. Yeah. Thank you. And then she turns and goes back toward the lobby. I mean, so you just wraps up what she's doing, checks in on the person she's helping with, and then scuttles it out to find the girl she just talked to. All right. So as you go through the curtain, you see two more figures out there that's that are standing kind of close to Soldier. Uh, one, a very tall African American man, very good looking. Uh, and a shorter, uh, kind of nondescript. Uh, man in Caucasian, a uh, little bit scruffy around the edges, um, and wearing kind of a white hoodie. Right. Was it... Soldier. Soldier. In- yeah. Soldier. Yeah. Hi. These Hi. Are your friends. Yes. Um. This. This is uh, Oswin, and this here is a uh, Carl. Yeah. And um. Well, we're here. Uh, we found you, and um, I think I think we need your help. All right. What can I help you with? Good. Good question. <laughs> um, Why don't you let Oswin talk? He's better at this. Yeah, I, I, Oswin. Do you want to let her know? Sure. Uh, hi, Oswin. Hello. So. A little moth on Sojourn's shoulder mm-hmm. led her to me, and then it led her, us to Carl. 
And then it led us to you. And you and I somehow have seen each other before. I can't quite place it. But yes, we will think that you can help us. And or, as he sorry. speaks, sorry, as he speaks, you feel a warmth uh, inside you, uh, Celia. Okay. And that warmth is something that's very familiar to you. And it's your, it's your partner, <laughs> your internal partner. That warmth of his voice just washes over you and it lights that little light that is within. And you can tell that this man, while you've never yourself seen him before, there's a familiarity that is coming from the light that is inside you. And it is telling you to trust this man. Aswin? Aswin Barka. No. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Celia Burton. Uh, you know, ah, this is very interesting. I've heard of a butterfly effect, but never a moth effect. <laughs> but I like it. It's different. I'm wondering, do you have a moment, uh, or can you clock out and join us? Yeah, let Absolutely. Let me check in, make sure everything's all right around here, and I can definitely give you guys a moment. Or two. Great. <laughs> we'll be here waiting. All right. Sojourn. Mm -hmm. You seem to be uncomfortable. I'm I'm not gonna lie to you, Oswin. I'm a I'm a little scared. Those uh the visions I saw you all in were let's say not pleasant. What do you mean? I just didn't like the feeling they gave me. It wasn't like when you wake up from a happy dream. It what was, it I was doing? more like you were really concerned with what you were doing in my dream, aren't you? What was I doing? You... Well, I don't even the you that I saw was just walking down the street holding a backpack. I assume you were on your way to work. But the the other visions I saw, I, I don't know if they were you, but it felt like you. And you were fighting. Look, let's just wait for Celia to get back and, and we can all go somewhere together and, and talk a little bit more about this. I'm sorry. I, I know this is weird and I know how I'm coming off. I just, I see a lot more than most people. Um, even the hucksters on TV that can tell you they can speak to your dead family and goofy things that you know they're lying about. I, Those kind of things, I do see them for real. And the visions I saw were not something isn't right. That's that's what I know. And you were there and Celia was there and Oswin was there. I just know we have to figure out what we're supposed to do. Seems like a good moment so you come back. <laughs> All right, good looking. I'm yours for the rest of the evening. Okay. He walks over to the desk, the makeshift desk, and turns in uh, the form. And Carl notices that he puts in the name Aswan Kajia. And then he turns, says, All right, Celia. Let's uh, let's follow the moth. Sojourn, lead the way. How is that spelled? Soldier. Oh, Kajia. Kajia. Oh, Kajia. K a j i y a. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. Moth is M O T H. 
<laughs> oh, I know that. <laughs> smells Bell's moth. So while you guys have uh, been here at the homeless shelter, the rain outside has finally kicked in uh, and picked up. It's not a heavy, heavy rain, but it's a good, solid, steady rain. Uh, enough to whip out the umbrellas if you've got them. I just um, have the hoodie. Moths don't do well <laughs> in all of this, so it's going to be a little bit of a difficult travel. But one thing that you do recall from your visions is the final spot where you were to end up was a morgue. Um, and Saturn, as he tries to flutter out, he keeps getting wet and he kind of keeps coming back under the uh, uh, scarf umbrella. Yeah. Oh, under the umbrella. And yeah, just trying, just trying to kind of find a spot, and it gets up under the umbrella so that it can be dry, but then it kind of walks over to a certain spot and stays there which kind of makes you go, okay, am I supposed to go this way? <laughs> and then as you do, it scuttles along and is pointing you in the direction underneath the umbrella, uh, in the direction that you need to go. And you find yourself actually kind of heading back towards home. Mm -hmm. um, not exactly, but in that general direction. Uh, but you end up uh, approaching uh the Presbyterian hospital that is close to Hell's Kitchen. Okay. It the Presbyterian Hospital stands tall, kind of a modern sentinel of healing against the urban backdrop. And as dusk is now settling into night, the hospital's exterior is aglow with the soft luminescence of its windows, reflecting the hustle and bustle within. The grand entrance, flanked by towering columns, serves as a beacon for those seeking solace amidst the storm of uncertainty. As you and your companions approach, the rain begins to pick up a little bit more, and creating a shimmering curtain that veils the hospital's facade. The rhythmic tapping of raindrops on the pavement provides a soundtrack to your little quest. You step through the hospital's automatic doors. Saturn uh, gets out from underneath the umbrella and crawls uh, kind of close to you again, kind of acting as that little pin on, on your shawl um, and you're enveloped by the antiseptic scent of the cleanliness of the hospital it's unmistakable every time you walk into one of these places it's all it always smells the same and the lobby uh, has got kind of soft overheaded lightning lighting and there's a sense of calm as you guys walk in Oz when you get it another tingle again uh, since this is a Presbyterian hospital, there is certainly a chapel here on the premises, so you again feel that call to the holy ground. Um, there's polished floors that guide you to an information desk. Now, in your vision, soldier, and you recall that you ended up in a morgue mm -hmm. and there is something that's kind of telling you right now that's probably everything else so far has been exactly as you saw it in your vision and being here in the hospital that's the feeling is that you've probably got to find the morgue okay um I kind of turn because we're in the front part of the hospital right now, and I kind of let them know, like, guys, I I know this has been a weird day. Um, I think we got to get down to the morgue. Uh, also, don't know if we're allowed to just walk down there like that. Um, that's where we got to get to. 
And so I start kind of look, I will start looking around for signs because I'm not, I'm not going to straight up, hey, where's your morgue? I'm not going to ask anybody, but I kind of do start looking around for signs to see if there's anything that points us in that direction. I make a perception check. Got it. Yeah. There's no like big signs that says morgue here. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Yeah. No, but just those little. Not something they normally advertise. Um, Right. But uh, you do head over toward the elevators, and there's a directory there that kind of lines out what each what is on each floor. Uh, and to no surprise, the morgue is in the basement. Okay. So yeah, I'll kind of motion to the gang and click on the elevator, and we're gonna head down and kind of we're just going to do that thing where we walk with purpose like we're supposed to be there and see what happens <laughs> Oswin puts his arm around Sojourn as if to be consoling and he just says roll with it and gets in the elevator just stands there with his arm around her alright the elevator takes you down to the basement uh, and opens up and it's uh, technically after hours so the lights in the basement now have been kind of dimmed to every other light rather than all of the fluorescence going all the way down the hallways being on they've tripped a breaker and it's a little darker down here than the warm and welcoming lobby that you guys walked in it's cold down here you can tell that there's a little bit of a, a difference in temperature down here um, you kind of navigate the labyrinthine corridors and pass by rooms uh, filled with little beeps and sounds of mechanical equipment here and there. If you pass by the boiler room, loud roaring sounds coming behind there. And then you eventually kind of round a corner and you spot an area that looks like it probably would be the morgue and there is a kind of a cubicle set inset within the wall uh, of the hallway here just outside the door a big kind of iron door Uh, and inside the cubicle is a is a night watchman security guard what's um Sojourn the moth. What's the moth doing? Still right now, just just, just kind of hanging out. Yeah. Uh, Oswin walks with Sojourn up to the desk, and uh, he's gonna talk to the the person at the desk. Says, Excuse me. We're here to see someone. I believe. He kind of just looks apprehensive and as if he's looking for, like, he's, he doesn't want to say it, but he's just kind of, and he, he grips Sojourn on the shoulder. He says, we lost someone. We're here to make an identification, and I'm going to use a charisma deception check. Okay. Hey. Hey, hey look at that. <laughs> nice. Oh, yeah, they told me you were coming. Um, Give me just a second here. I'll just have to have you sign in, if you wouldn't mind just signing right here, whoever's going in. Sure. I can do that. And he goes and writes down Uh, Oswin Baracus. Okay. And then everybody else, uh, is it just you and the girl, or is everybody going in? Oh, right now it's, I think it should just be us. And he kind of looks over to Sojourn. And she, she gets, you know, kind of what he's doing and starts welling up a little bit and go and just nods like. What? Are, are, are you sure, honey? I'm sorry. This is, my husband tends to get a little overprotective. This is our niece. Are you sure you just want yeah. Yeah, you're more than happy to accompany if you feel you need more. I'll I'll be fine, Auntie. Of course. 
All right, so are you just going in? Yeah, I think it's just me and uh, me and Oswin. Right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right, so the security guard gets up, goes over to the door, uh, pulls out a key ring and tries two keys before he actually gets the right one, uh, unlocks the door, uh, and then opens it, uh, and then ushers the two of you in, closes the door behind him. Those of you outside don't hear it lock. Husband? A broken dream? <laughs> <laughs> um, a single light flickers to life uh, as you guys go in. Seems like it's maybe motion sensor. Uh, and then, curiously, in the pool of light sits a black cat. And its eyes are gleaming with kind of an otherworldly wisdom. When the cat spots you guys come in, it trots over to Oswin and crisscrosses between his legs, rubbing up against his calves, as if meeting an old friend. Oswin kind of just skips a beat and then kind of looks down at the cat and kind of has a, has a smile. And then he goes down, reaches down and pets the cat and says, oh, what are you doing here? And the security guard says, what in the hell? How in the hell did that fucking cat get in here? Uh, sorry, miss. Uh, here, let me let me get that thing out of here. And he reaches for it and it, it hisses at him. And he pulls back real quick. Holy shit, that thing's mean. Oswin reaches down, picks up the cat, gives it a nice pet. You just have to be non-threatening, sir. I'll take care of it on our way out. Ah, oh, shit. God damn it. I never know what to expect in this damn place. And as he says that, you hear kind of off in the corner, off in the darkness, just as your eyes are kind of beginning to adjust to the dimness in here, a rather haunting sound kind of permeating the air. It's the gentle weeping of a woman echoing through the sterile chamber. The atmosphere hangs heavy in the presence of the feline guardian and this mysterious weeping sound create a rather eerie tableau down here. Is, are we hearing any of this outside? Uh, you don't hear the weeping. And you maybe hear just a little bit of a muffled, what the hell is that thing? I'm going to look through the papers on his desk to see what name he used, Wasman used when he signed in. Mm -hmm, sure. Yeah, it's definitely the same first name, but a different last name. And slightly he different than the one that he gave you. I knew he wasn't Japanese. We gave you that idea. The paperwork he handed in at the clinic. His last that name was Kajima. Kajia. Kajia. You're very trusting, by the way. Never done me wrong before. Well, usually there was, was that. you know, I didn't do that. You're not. You haven't hung around the people I've hung around. Clearly. So what's your story? Why? How? What? What kind of people you've been hanging around? Because it's it's clearly not a good kind. Don't. You don't need to know that yet. You okay. probably won't. I, I probably won't be here tomorrow. So don't don't. Just don't. Don't worry about it. You don't need to know me. But people around me, yeah. Just you just don't need to know me. Okay, all right, Mr. Mysterious. We can leave it that way. You just go flirt with your big black guy. <laughs> oh, I will do that in time. Trust me. Now, you're not going to be here tomorrow. Look, we are in a hospital. I am somewhat medical, you know, professor, whatnot. Do we need to, um, 
Do you have any feelings that you're going to harm yourself or anyone else? Oh, no, no, no. Trust okay. me. Oh, I'm okay. the last person that's going to harm me. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, you know don't what? Like don't, don't overanalyze it. No, Trust me. No, no, I'm no, fine. No. I'm not crazy. Okay. I'm totally sane now. Well, that's boring. <laughs> and we'll shift Trust back me, into it that way. We're going to shift back into the morgue. And the uh, night watchman now is fumbling for a flashlight. <laughs> And he gets it out and clicks it and shines it in the area that he that you all are hearing this whimpering and weeping and he clicks it into the corner of the room and there is a figure crouched in a fetal position in the corner of the room and it's hard to really make out they look like they have long hair maybe but it's Everything is completely crusted, and the figure is almost entirely black. What the fuck is that? Who is that? You, you there, stand up. Stand up, get up now. What are you doing in here? And Dragon, that is you. Uh -huh. I kind of look up towards them and then just scream, like, blood curdling. Oh, Jesus Christ! Now he's reaching for a taser <laughs> and fumbling. Oswin runs over to the I rush him. I oh. rush him. You're going to rush him? Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, what are you going to do? Uh, just screaming the whole time and just kind of kind of tackle him and just okay. All right, so he begins to back up and you grab hold of him and end up pushing him down to the ground. You've got a hold of his like lapels and screaming at him and he just ah! oh! just passes out. <laughs> or did we hear the high pitched yeah, scream? Yeah, you you heard that scream. Um yeah, if I heard the high pitched scream, I survival instinct would have taken and I would have ran in there too so that I knew what was going on all right so you go in uh does uh uh Celia follow uh, kind of with the oh boy here we go no. <laughs> <laughs> um so you guys go in and you see um Oswin and soldier standing kind of in shock as this woman is crouched on top of the night watchman uh she's crusted in like this layer of like black sooty crusty ash type stuff and is slowly sloughing itself off of her body as she is shaking uh and screaming at this man calm yourself Calm yourself. You're among friends. We're actually here to help you. Actually helping help, help you to help us. My name is Oswin. That was again. Who are you? What's your name? I uh, climb off of the uh, night uh, guard and kind of back away from everybody and I kind of start holding myself like my stomach and just kind of like rocking back and forth standing or back in the fetal position kind of back in the fetal position okay as you back up you back up kind of hit the wall again and then kind of slowly slink down and as you do you leave this like ashy uh, smear on the wall as you slide down as she yes. kind of goes back into that position more of this crusty stuff begins to fall off of her and you see this woman and like her face that's when she screamed everything started to kind of break away from the face and starting to reveal like a very clean olive skin underneath uh and you can see now that this woman is completely naked 
Are there any um, like blankets or like uh, anything that covers and like yeah, basically he's sure. going to go for it. Yeah, yeah. There, there's a, a stack of kind of clean sheets by the door. There are sheets covering bodies uh, in here as well. Are there any of those gowns that they might use for cleanliness as they do what they do? Like a apron sort of yes. thing? Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So he grabs one of those and the blanket. And he grabs a blanket and sort of goes up to her and puts it around her shoulders. And at that point, he puts down the cat when he grabs all this stuff. Mm-hmm. And he says, you look like you've been through something. But please, Relax. Again, here, warm yourself. And he opens up the, the basically the, the uh, I can't, apron. And, um, and Answer says, here, clothe yourself. And this is kind of like a, uh, almost like a, not quite a jumpsuit kind of deal, but something kind of similar that she could potentially step in and then you can kind of tie it off in the back uh it, and it's just like yellow and it's got the elastic on the sleeves and on the uh on the feet utilitarian mm-hmm. uh, she kind of just kind of numbly uh, goes through it gets getting clothed He looks I mean, for um, like towels or like a little face nappy or anything like that to give her so she can clean herself on her face. Celia is actually going to go and start scavenging around for things to clean up and whatnot. Mm-hmm. And Soldier starts to approach to a bit timidly, as timidly and softly as possible, and says, uh, "I'm Soldier." What's your name? Mm-hmm. My name. My name. There's so much pain, madness, hurt. My name is you. It's you. It's you. I am Elder. Azu, it's good to meet you. Hayashi. Uh, yeah. Azu Hayashi. Hayashi. Great. Uh, I'm, I'm Soldier. This is Oswin and Carl and Celia. And I I don't know how to tell you this, but Oswin spoke true. We're here to help you. We're here to find you. Um, we're here to help you. Do you know what happened to you? I do. Do I remember? Yeah. Um, fire, death, pain, loss, everything, everything burning. And then soldier says it was a stove, wasn't it? And she just kind of looks at you. Was it you? No, 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 of course not. No, no, I, listen, I, I see things. I have, I have visions. I, I saw you, I saw the stove in a vision. You, you can trust me. We, we know, we know that we need your help, but obviously, obviously you, you've been through a lot. We, uh, we just want to make sure you're okay first. You Hmm. got pretty, pretty. There will never be okay. Celia's gonna come scurrying back in with just an armful of things. Nope. Found the kitchen. Here you go. Water, sweetie. You look like you could use it. Grab the water for everybody else just in case. Found snack cakes. I Always pour it over my, my head and face. And it all washes right. all the rest of the ash away. And you see that this is a beautiful Asian woman. 
At that point, well, Oswin were... hands the towels to, to her. Well, you were absolutely stunning, can I just say? Uh, uh, Mr. Moody Pants, mysterious. You gonna drink your water? She can have it. Okay, give it to her. Also, uh, grab snack cakes. Maybe, maybe a little blood sugar. Grab one for you, good looking. Uh, you are I, not thirsty. You are yeah, not hungry. I, yeah, I, I don't. I don't. I just kind of like, no, no, thank you. All right, Chloe. Also, uh, snagged paper towels if you need anything else to clean off. And uh, if there's anything else we need or anything I can do to help you feel comfortable and feel better, just say, and I'll go right again. Where am I? You're in the morgue in the Presbyterian Hospital. Located, and he, where is that exactly? Uh, just outside of Hale's Kitchen. Okay, and so he relays that information to her. And my family, did anybody in my family survive? And she kind of just looks down at her, her stomach. That and I have nothing to tell you. I don't know. And your I stomach just, is flat. Mm-hmm. And she just starts crying. Oh, honey. Celia wants to immediately reach down. Ask, is it okay if I touch you? Can I can I give you a hug? I, can I comfort you? Uh, she just kind of nods. And... All right. So he's just going to pull her into a big bear hug, holding cradle in her head. Soldier is kind of looking around and realizing the guard is still kind of passed out on the floor and that we, we have just essentially woken a dead woman in a <laughs> morgue. And so she just kind of says softly to, to the group, I know all this is disorienting, but I think we need to get out of here soon. You'd, you'd probably notice I'm like icy cold to the touch too. Absolutely. Yeah, so right. yeah, let's get out here, get her some warm clothes, and some are a lot more warmer than in here. Soldier says my my place isn't far. Lead the way. Uh, look towards the the cat, uh, uh, Bathsheba. <laughs> I look and at my watch. What time is it? Uh, it's about 7.30. Got a couple more hours, kid. Okay. Let's hurry. You said you live around here, Sojourn? Let's go. Let's try and avoid anywhere. Let's look for, let's look for a back door of some sort. And you'll look for a back door. Okay, yeah. And you guys are able to kind of scuttle your new companion out of the hospital uh, and begin making your way back into Hell's Kitchen. Uh, And you know the path to your home, that's not a problem. But as you're kind of heading on that path, Saturn takes flight again and goes in a different direction. And Soldier just kind of sighs and is like, really, buddy? Uh, guys, sorry. Uh, just trust me. We got to go. We got to go this way. And she kind of cuts across the across to where he fluttered off to instead of toward home. Doesn't really wait for a response on that. Just keeps her eyes on Saturn and expects everyone to move with her. Austin sort of stands there and does the go ahead to Carl. Do we pass like a hot dog cart or anything like that? <laughs> sure, Carl has yeah, any. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Saturn will wait for you to get your hot dog. <laughs> <laughs> He's you a patient, take one patient little guy. So Saturn takes flight and you guys end up approaching what looks like an abandoned warehouse. And it stands as kind of a forgotten relic of the city's industrial past. The red bricks worn by the passage of time form a rugged facade against the urban decay. Faint graffiti on the walls bear witness to the transient stories that have passed through its forgotten halls. 
um, Hasu, as you guys are approaching this building, you recognize where you are. This is somewhere that you and some of your co co-workers would come to kind of secretly play test the game that you had been working on, The Streets Run Red. Um, it was off the books. It was somewhere that there, it's hard to describe, but each of you that had participated in the playtesting of this game had this urge, this feeling to just want to go back to it. And you couldn't always do it back at the offices. So there were a couple of the tech guys that kind of set up this makeshift place where you guys could come in your downtime and just revisit the game. Uh, and do work while you were there. Uh, but more often than not, it was just that itch that needed to be scratched someplace where you could go back and play and just experience Whitechapel. So this is familiar to you. Okay. And it, um, it's like a... Um... Uh, like a cafe or something, or like an internet cafe, or what is it, like an no, office? No, no, no. It's, it's it's like an old warehouse. Oh, okay. Um, and is it currently being in use, or no, not currently in use at all. No. Uh -uh. The the only in and out that uh, was going on there were from you and your companions from work. Oh, okay. One of the guys just knew about this place, knew that it would be someplace kind of far and away that nobody would actually try to come in, but uh, his dad owned the building and he knew that, that he could get in and out pretty easily. And, and you know there's a back way in uh, that is unlocked. You have to kind of go up like a fire escape to get in, uh, but you know that you can easily get into this place if you needed to. I, I I know I know this place. Why are we here? Moth brought us here. I was gonna say, Sojourn. Do you want to explain that? Yeah, uh, Saturn, my my friend here, and she kind of reaches down for her shawl and has a light on her hand again, and is like, can't really explain it, but uh, he led us to you. He he led me to. All, all of us. Um, he tends to warn me when there could be disaster. And all I knew was that if I didn't find you, all of you, something terrible was going to happen. But I, I've got you all here now. You, Saturn, hear that? I, they're all here. And now we've got to figure out... I'm sorry, you talk to a moth and then I kind of glance at the cat and be like, do you believe this? Meow. <laughs> and I said, well, not not so much as, as talk as listen really, but yeah, I, uh, I can't explain it, but I have a connection with this little guy. So how do we get in here? I assume we're going in. Uh, there's a, a spot around the back. It's probably not locked. We Either used to way, come through. You, you seem to know it. Let's follow you for a while. But, I'm here to follow people. And Hasu goes around towards the back. And you see the uh, fire escape. Uh, and it's got you know, kind of one of those things you got to jump up and kind of pull down. Um, you've never been able to actually reach it before because of your height. You had to let one of the other guys do it, and sometimes they would even have to get up on each other's shoulders to pull it down. Uh, but just an instinct kind of overtakes you as you go back there, and you take just a little bit of a trot of about five steps, pop, 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 leap up, grab it, pull it down, and then just zip up 
the fire escape and bound from one level basically to the next until you get up to about the third floor, which is where you know the door is. Uh, I'll look back at them and be like, what are you, what are you waiting for? Oswin kind of looks around and goes, what are we waiting for? <laughs> Let's go. And he walks to the ladder. And the black cat also just kind of bounds up uh, and comes right next to Hasu uh, as she opens the door into the warehouse. The air inside is thick with the hint of dust and uh, a little bit of mildew. And dim light filters in through the cracked windows, revealing a rather cavernous space marked by decay and neglect. But as you guys come in, kind of an unexpected sight begins to unfold. You've got to kind of walk down a set of steps to kind of get into this main area. And as you walk down the stairs to get in here, uh, you are kind of struck by this sight in stark contrast to the dilapidated exterior. The interior hosts kind of a hub of advanced computer technology. There's four desks that have been pushed together in kind of a makeshift formation supporting an array of high-end computers. Cables snake across the floor like security veins, or c circuitry veins, sorry, uh, climbing the walls to connect with a large uh, rectangular mechanical contraption at the room's far end. A mesmerizing display of LED cords inset into the contraption pulses with an otherworldly glow and nearby, a high-tech makeshift lounge chair takes center stage with cables attached to a VR headpiece. Carl, your eyes widen with recognition at this. It's a bit crude, but it is a reproduction of the Animus, the device that had been your tether to the enigmatic world of Abstergo Incorporated. And the chair stands as a haunting echo of your past, sparking memories of a time that you were ensnared in a web of secrets and manipulation. Is this like what we normally use to interface with the game or is this like a completely... Nope, that's what you guys put together uh, to, oh. to be able to access it, yeah. I... Don't say a word. Turn around. Start walking at the door. <laughs> Carl. Carl. And he, he follows Carl to the door. Yeah, soldier does too. Run, kind of run, tries to run and run ahead of him, and being like, "Wait, wait, 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 wait." Does it please like tell us what happened? Why? Why would you leave all of a sudden? seems to be safe in here safe from whatever it is you're huh. what's so funny you, you fucking think you're safe <laughs> who the fuck is she which one the one that the burnt Hatsu who are you how did you find me You found me. That's true. That's fair. Who do you work for? Uh, do, do you need the name? <laughs> the say, uh, uh, the uh, Rena uh, Seance was the name of the. Oh right, Rena Seance. Yes. Um, I work for uh, this company on a video game. Uh, and I found, uh, this technology that seemed impossible. Who gave you no, that technology? No, nobody would believe me. Who gave you the fucking technology? It was them, wasn't it? Who I was it? Say it! I and don't, you know, you I, know the name, you know the name. Oh, uh... Yeah. Abstergo. Oh, Abstergo, yeah. 
Observable oh. bought, bought our company. I turn around and head out the door. Bye. I'm out. People can all just fuck off. I'm gone. And Frank, you're you're muted. Soldier cries out to him. Wait, wait. You can you can tell us what this is though. Come. You have to come back and help, please. Oh, I, I was just gonna say, like, I, this is the technology that to use to interact with this game that somehow interacts with the past. Wait a minute, it's a, it's a game? You're you're leaving over a game? Wait, Carl, what do you know about this? This is more than a game. You think, yeah, listen to her. Are we in danger? Well. I think history as we know it could be in danger if this gets into the wrong hands. Considering someone's house was just blown up. Considering these people have been after me for 10 years. Yeah. I think we're in fucking people? danger, and I want to get the hell out of it, so goodbye. They, they're the ones who blew my house up? They're the ones that killed my family? Do you honestly think you're safer alone? Right now, houses are being blown up. We have people who actually have answers. What? Stay with us. At least until we figure out why we're all here together. Hatsu starts clenching her fists like I can't, these those bastards and just cursing in Japanese under her breath. Carl, somehow Carl, we know each you other. You said people have been after you for how long? 10 years. 10 years, so. When you would think I, I get the whole like Mr. Mysterious thing, but these are the kinds of things you maybe want to share with people so they can make judgment calls about what's going on. Fair enough. He came and found me. Yes, because either we helped you or you were going to help us. And I think it's a bit of both. So how about you at least help us understand what danger we're in. Please? You're with us. Sorry. Where did you get that blade? What, this? He opens it up, pulls it out again. Yes. Just fiddles around that. and turns around. I bought it. Impossible. No. Not impossible at all. When did you buy it? You said it was priceless. I actually got it for a favor. You bought it for a favor. Yeah. No, no. If you must know, if it makes you calm, I bought it in Italy. Rome, to be specific. When? Oh. Sometime. And he pretends to be thinking about it. He knows exactly when, but he just pretends to like he's drawing, to, like tethering his memories. And then he gives the year. And I believe you would probably know that, Kristen. Probably about 1476. Woo, handy's well traveled. 1476. Does that scare you or make you more comfortable? Both. Ten years is a blink. Just share one moment with us. When he says 1476, soldier. The entire room begins to spin on you. And the backdrop of the old dilapidated warehouse just begins to fall away. And you see yourself now in a cemetery. 
surrounded by these same four people. And you see Oswin looking basically the same in the face as what he does now. But as the room falls away, his clothing begins to change. Uh, and he is dressed in like a suit of armor with kind of a reddish cloak cape uh, and almost like a red skirt. You look over at um, Carl and the white hoodie uh, that he is wearing kind of transforms into a very heavy cloth kind of tabard with a yellow sash. And he does not look like Carl anymore. It's a different man that is standing there, but somehow you know that this is Carl. Glancing over to Celia is a bit shocking, but in the position that she was, you see her whole facade just begin to flake away, and there's a shorter, bespectacled, bearded man standing there. Uh, dressed in old Italian everyday clothes that look like about 15th century. And finally, where Hasu is, stands a tall, almost Amazonian, olive-skinned woman uh, wearing a masquerade mask of a cat and a tight bustier, looks almost Romani, gypsy, if we use the inappropriate term, but of the time it would have been appropriate. And you see them for who they are and names begin to come out of your mouth as you are looking at them and you're pointing and your eyes have rolled back into your head everybody else sees her do this and she points and she says oswin baracus pardo bernanati leonora gray silvestro sanudo as I hear that, I go, fuck. And I am Madalena. And then your eyes come back. Everything falls back into place. You are in the present. And you falter at the knees. Begin to pass out. Question? Yeah. Um, did I go back or is this just me? Uh, it's just you. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Just you in the present day. You didn't see any of that. The only thing you saw was her pointing and saying your old name. Okay. Well, his, that's what I was asking. Is it his current name? Basically. Uh, if, if that is your current name, then yes. <laughs> back in 1476. Yes. Baracus. Yes. Uh, -huh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, I guess he will move towards. Uh, is it so, so? Does he know her by Sojourn? Sojourn or, is, is yeah. her name, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, to, to catch her and kind of pick her up. Carl just drops, sitting cross legged, the hands over his head. Celia would have rushed in to try to catch too. And yeah, as everybody do does that, I'm I'm kind of putting putting my hands out and starting to get up. Like I'm I'm okay, I'm okay. I got it, I got it. It's fine, it's fine. And with that, you know that um, Carl is the key 
to all of this. Each of you have a role to play. You know now that Hasu must have vengeance for what happened to her and to her family. And the only way that she can accomplish that is by Carl getting in that chair. Now, Oswin doesn't remember any of that, obviously. So he's a little out of the loop, right? Oswin, Oswin probably, with, with the mention of those names that she brought out, it certainly brings back recognition of, I know those names. Mm -hmm. But again, he hasn't lived that. He sort of has. Okay, in, I'm just I'm trying one, to play this. So I know. Like, <laughs> in in one way or me. another, he mm -hmm. has. But, and out of game, just to kind of explain it to you, He's experienced everything up until this point, but what you guys could do may change the past, and that's why everything is fuzzy for you in those time periods. That's why you don't have a clear recollection, because what you're about to do might just change it enough to rewrite your memories. So everything seems familiar, but just yeah. foggy. Yeah, everything. But he knows these are friends, or they are acquaintances, and there is a common goal. And and you now do at least get the feeling that this idea of you feeling like you know all of these people, even though you've never seen their faces before, you know their essence, you know what is inside them, and you feel like you have had this experience again and again and again and again over the years and it's all tied up to the fogginess that is in your brain surrounding those little moments in time that you just are not you're just struggling to really fill in those blanks so he's familiar with the feeling yeah okay When everybody speak at once. Well, only uh, the sojourn got the insight about all that, right? Like, I don't know that he needs to get in the chair. Um, okay, so I would say while all of that was going on, the black cat jumped up into your arms, and when that happened. I think you probably saw that vision as well of everything falling away and you looking into the past. So yeah, I, I would call that a shared vision for you. Just Carl just finally goes, where did you hear that name? It was a vision. I. To what I saw, I, I could, I knew your names, and I, I could see you wearing a hood and 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 yellow, and I could see Celia. She, she was a, a man and old, and I, I could see all of you. I, I Carl, I, I don't know how to explain this, but Were these are like our ancestors, some sort of relations. For me, it was spiritual successors. And Sid, that mm -hmm. light inside of you when the name Pardo was uttered, fluttered. Okay. You, you've never heard that name before, but when he pointed, or when she pointed to you and said that name, it was as if she was speaking to you when she said that name. She turns to Carl and says, so what happened to you that you fear this chair so? 
What do you know about Astergo? What do you know about this technology and what it does? Barely the basics. I, I, I know that it can affect the past somehow. Somehow it, it connects you to a, a person or a, a place in time. And that somehow you can possess them. Did you use it? We're developing a, we were developing a game that utilizes this technology. It, it was about to go be everywhere. It still may be, I don't know. I, I know that I can't let this happen though. I can't let them get away with what they've done. I was recruited by Abstergo. Apparently I have a very colorful family history that goes back a long, long time. Thought it was a job, thought it'd be fun. I like technology for a time. But then, yeah, I wanted to leave. And they wouldn't let me. Every time I hooked up to that thing, I went into someone's head and had no control over anything. I was just a passenger along with it, but they were pulling the information from the history as I was doing it, and they just wouldn't. Just kept getting longer and longer every time, sometimes days, weeks. They just kept me in there. Well, this one is different because you aren't just a passenger. You can actually do things. This is far more dangerous. I know. But we need someone with experience to use it. This gives you the agency you so wanted. <laughs> Soldier and kind of looks up, looks up at him while he's muttering like that, and just says, "Carl, look, I promised you, you could go if you didn't trust us, but I think you can tell now that that we need we need you, and I I just wanted to say I'm sorry." I didn't choose this. I didn't want any of this to happen. And we're not going to, we're, we're going to do everything we can to make sure nothing happens to you. But above all, I, I'm sorry we had to drag you into this. We stay and help. All right. Fine. Guess I'm going to go back in. I'm going to go back in on my terms, not their terms. What do you need from us? You can watch me. Do you need someone to stand guard? <laughs> yeah. That they're I can gonna, do. They're gonna know. Ashu. Did I say that right? Sue. 
Sue. That's Sue. That's what I said. <laughs> um, can this place be tracked? If he goes in, would they know that this is the place? Or is it shielded? Some, and I, I was assuming that we, if we were using it like after hours, we probably had it on its like a private network or something. Your guys were pretty good, yeah. Um, we should be okay. It's just interacting with anyone else who might be in the game as well. Might would be the only way that we might tip somebody off. I would I would think. I don't know. Be careful. Try not to touch anything. <laughs> it's not how it works. You'll have to explain it to me one day. Apparently they've gotten better at it. Yes, it's very uh, state-of-the-art. So... Sojourn, you said you saw who you guys all were. I imagine that's who I need to be looking for. Yeah, do you remember the names? No. Repeat them back. Good. What about you? Something tells me you'll find me or I'll find you. Well, I guess I get to go visit an old relative of mine. He, he turns and looks at Oswin. You, you said you were in Rome? Yes. I'll be in Florence. I can meet you there. Okay. We doing this now, or? You better be doing this now, because if you let me leave, I'm not coming back. So let's do this. Yes, get yourself ready. I too must prepare for war. And when you say that, you head over to a set of lockers that are on the side of the wall and open a couple of them up. Uh, and you pull out kind of this black suit that has like this greenish like mm -hmm. LED lighting uh, that's kind of connected to it. You grab one uh, to bring it over to Carl to have him put it on, and then you stop about two steps. You go back and you grab another one. You hand that to him to have him put it on. You go hmm. off. Technology's gotten better. Change into the same suit uh, that he is in. And off on one of those four tables that were pushed together, the last time that you were here was uh, the night before Halloween. Uh, and a couple of the guys and girls that were there um, came after a Halloween party. One of them left behind an LED mask that had some cat ears on it. You pick it up and you look at it. And you put it over your face and then it lights up uh, with kind of an LED kind of green uh, kind of cat face uh, as you do. And now you are prepared for war. Uh, it emotes like the uh, frowny cat face emoji for a second and then the smiley cat face emoji. Didn't know this would be a rave. <laughs> And Hasu goes about the process of hooking you up to this makeshift animus, puts the VR helmet over top of your head, and that familiar sound of this kind of mechanical whining sound mixed with a digital screech begins to 
fill your ears and you are now being sent through the animus back to the year 1499 and I think we'll call it there for tonight <laughs>